Last Sunday, we began a new series uh, of messages entitled, My Heart, Christ's Home. And this is based on a little booklet that Robert Munger put together way back in the 1950s. So this booklet is well over 60 years old now. And uh, it's a, we have a few of these still available in the back. I think there's about eight or nine of them on the table. So if you did not pick up one, we were asking one per family. You were very, very good about that, very frugal. Some of, you may not have, some of your family members may not have picked up one at all. If you're an individual and, uh, and you haven't picked one up, uh, they're still there, first come, first serve. Once they're gone, just contact us at the office. We'll give you a, a, a website where you can download the booklet in its entirety and have it uh, uh, on your computer or print it off for your own reading. That's an easy read, and it's just basically the premise that as we accept Christ as Lord, we invite Jesus to come into our hearts and into our lives through the Holy Spirit. When Jesus occupies us through his Spirit, we want to show him around. We want to let him see what this house is like. And so last week, we took Jesus to the study, to the library. And we realized that there were some books on the shelves and some magazines on the table, and some pictures on the walls that his pure eyes could not look at. And we realized that there's some things that needed cleaned up in the study. Jesus offered to let him clean up the study. And we, and we understand that life can be all the easier when we surrender the study to Jesus. This morning we're talking about the dining room, and there's two passages of Scripture. I think, I think what I want to do this morning is read both passages right now so that we have the scriptural base for the message. So the first passage is in Isaiah 55, and it's in verses 1 through 5, and then the second passage is at the end of the New Testament in the book of 1 John. So uh, turn with me to Isaiah 55. Uh, Isaiah is uh, after the Psalms and the Proverbs, and uh, it's, it's the beginning of, of the... Uh, the books of the prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah 55, if you find Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, you're getting there. Just, just go a little further, you'll be in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 55, and I want to read verses 1 through 5. This is an invitation from God. It's an invitation to dine with him, to eat of his food. Do you have it? Isaiah 55, 1 through 5. This is a declaration from God. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you, will have, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and, and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me, hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of peoples. Surely you will summon nations you do not know, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. That splendor comes because we are feasting at God's table. And then over in 1 John, 1 John, now don't confuse that with the Gospel of John, which is the fourth book in the New Testament. 1 John is a little book back toward the end, just before Revelation. You have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Three, three very short books. And in 1 John chapter 2, I want to look at verses 15 through 17. And listen to what the Apostle John says about feasting on the right things. 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 15. John said, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. We are in this series of messages based on the book, My Heart, Christ's Home. And today, 
Today, we are moving into a favorite room for a lot of us. Today, we are moving into the dining room. We are visiting the dining room. Can I have the dining room slide up? One more. Just keep going. There, the dining room. I chose a picture that uh, is very, very vintage because when I think of a dining room, I think of Grandma's house. When I think of a place to go and sit down and have a wonderfully prepared meal with people that I love, you know, I think of the family gatherings and I think of going to Grandma's house. This is the room of appetites and desires. It is where our wants and our needs are satisfied. And as I said, when I think of a dining room, I think of special meals and special people. I think it would be good, too, to just read what uh, Robert Munger wrote about the dining room. Very short, but very to the point. Remember, they had just been in a study, and we talked about that last week. And then they move on. It says, from the study, we went to the dining room, the room of appetites and desires. Now, this was a large room, a most important place for me. I spent a lot of time and hard work trying to satisfy all my wants. I told him, I told Jesus, this is a favorite room. I'm sure you will be pleased with what we serve here. He seated himself at the table and inquired, what's on the menu for dinner tonight? Well, I said, my favorite dishes, money academic degrees, stocks, with newspaper articles of fame and fortune as side dishes. These were the things I liked, thorough, a thoroughly secular fare. There was nothing so very bad in any of them, but it was not really the kind of food which would feed the soul and satisfy true spiritual hunger. When the plates were placed before my new friend, he said nothing. However, I, was, I observed that he did not eat. I asked, somewhat disturbed, Savior, don't you like this food? What's the trouble? He answered, I have food to eat that you do not know of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. He looked at me again and said, If you want food that really satisfies you, do the will of your heavenly Father. Put his pleasure before your own. Stop striving for your own desires, your own ambitions, your own satisfactions. Seek to please Him. That food will really satisfy you. Try a bit of it. And there about the table, He gave me a taste of doing God's will. What flavor! There is no food like it in all the world. It alone satisfies. At the end, everything else leaves you hungry. What's the menu in the dining room of our desires? What kind of food are we serving our divine companion and serving ourselves? 1 John 2.16 says, All that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, and the desire of the eyes, and the pride of riches, these are our self-centered wants. Or are we finding God's will to be our soul-satisfying meat and drink? In every community that we have lived in, there's always been someone in that community who was well known for their cooking. And to receive an invitation from them to come to their house for dinner was always an exciting thing to do. One such woman in our lives was Virginia Linton. Her son, Dr. Greg Linton, Linton served as a professor of New Testament uh, at, uh, and as academic dean uh, at Great Lakes Christian College. Greg Linton is now the professor of New Testament at Johnson University. But when Greg Linton was in high school, I was his minister. And on Sundays, Greg's mom only had to say one thing to me to get me salivating. She'd look me in the eye, and with a twinkle, she'd say, lasagna. And I would answer, we'll be there because that was her invitation. All she had to do was smile and say lasagna, and we knew that we were welcome to come with our two little munchkins in tow and fill that table with the rest of their family. She had the best lasagna I think I've had most of my life. 
You know, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, must have had someone like Virginia Linton in his life for him to say the things that he said about eating the right kind of food. And yet, we find that some people are crazy because they'll turn down an opportunity to eat a meal like that and instead will make a trip to McDonald's and fill themselves with junk. People will do that, and it's sad that they do that. But it's even sadder when we do that in this, in, in this spiritual food that Jesus is wanting to offer us. Why do we settle for junk food when we can sit down for a gourmet feast? It is ironic that we seem to want the best of everything in this life, and we work hard to get it, except when it comes to feeding our souls. When it comes to feeding our souls, we settle for less. Why do we do that? Why do we settle for less? Why do we go to extreme ends to try to make everything else right for us, but we take shortcuts when it's time to feed the soul? Well, there's three things I, I, I think would cause us to settle for less. The first one is this. We are always in a hurry. We're always in a hurry. We rush from one activity to the next. Um, we need to understand that one of the greatest obstacles to love is being in such a hurry. We miss out on things. What happens is that most of us have become infected with something that is not a medical term, but it describes very much our society. Some of us and many of us have become infected with hurry sickness. We hurry from here and we hurry from there. We have to go on. We, we just rush through everything in life and we rarely stop long enough to truly enjoy anything. We come up with all sorts of time-saving devices. drive throughs are one example. We can get our food at a drive-up window. We can get our money from a drive-up ATM. How many have been to some type of drive-up this week? Raise your hand, be honest. You've been to a drive -up. Okay, I have too. We pull in, we get our business done, we move on. Think about your schedules last week. Think about the way you may have rushed from one activity to another. The truth is, we live far too much of our life in this kind of hurry-up, drive-through mentality. And we think that's what life is about. And the truth is, at least for me, that I do the same thing with my spiritual diet. I rush through church. I get the job done. I'm here and then I'm gone. I grab a, a quick bite of devotion during the week. Maybe as I'm hurrying out the door to do something else. I toss in a prayer or two when I think about it between activities. I know it's not the best, but I tell myself that it'll do. Okay, it'll do. I'm still, I'm still maintaining contact with you, God. It's okay. Hurry keeps me from sitting down to the feast and hurry makes me settle for less. The food that really delights the soul cannot be found at a drive through window. The food that delights the soul, the finest fare, is not on a junk food menu. The food that satisfies and the food that delights is food that takes time to be prepared and it takes time to enjoy. Now we know that. We know that. If someone who was a gourmet cook would invite us, we know how important that is to be able to enjoy that, and still we settle for less. The second thing that happens that causes us to not enjoy what's offered is that we like junk food, don't we? Halloween's a coming. We like junk food. It comes neatly wrapped, and we can get it quickly, and it offers instant gratification, and it tastes okay. And we try to convince ourselves that it's really good for us. There, there was one minister I heard who said that his mother had a glass of Coca-Cola every morning for breakfast almost her entire life. And when this minister and his sister were old enough to ask about it, she would tell them it was prune juice so they wouldn't ask for any. <laughs> or maybe she told them it was prune juice just somehow to make them think that she was investing in a healthy diet. But we do the same thing, don't we? We go to the junk food. Bob Munger suggests that we fill our lives 
and our, uh, and our diets with our favorite dishes, with money, with academic degrees, with stocks, with newspaper articles of fame and fortune thrown in as side dishes. And then because we're so good at rationalizing things, we convince ourselves that this menu of money and degrees and success is good for our souls. We convince ourselves it's a healthy diet. And we say that our careers and our performances are the main ingredients of life and that high achievement or even overachievement is good for the soul. But have you ever noticed it doesn't work out that way? Have you ever noticed that all of our achievements and all of our accomplishments and all of our possessions eventually just fade away? They don't satisfy and we find ourselves back looking for more. We're still hungry and we're still thirsty. We're in a hurry and we like junk food. But the third problem is we replace food that is good with food that is dangerous. We turn to things like addictions, to substances, uh, that damage our bodies or damage our hearts. We turn to relationships that we know are dangerous and we know should not be a part of God's plan for our lives. We feed our hearts on entertainment that goes into the darkest recesses of our mind because it tastes good and because it feels good, we rationalize and say it must be good but it only brings on destructive behavior. And while our souls are starving, all the while, I should say, all the while, our souls are starving. I didn't mention this this morning during first service, but when we lived in Alaska, we had one winter up there, which uh, the snowfall was so heavy and so intense that the moose were being killed regularly out on the highways and out along the Alaska Railroad. They said that when the moose were hit by the trains and there were multiple moose kills every day on the tracks, that uh, they would give the moose carcasses away and the people who would open them up would find that the bellies of the moose were full, full. But they were full of twigs and bark and wood chips because that's all they could get. They were full, but they were malnourished. And that's the way we are sometimes in our lives. We replace what is good with what is dangerous. Our souls are starving. And eventually, because our achievements won't last, and because temptations will destroy us, we find ourselves spending money on what is not bread and labor on what will not satisfy. Exactly what Isaiah said. But I, I, I would say this. There's a better alternative out there. And we would be fools if we chose anything but the better alternative. Jesus said, don't work for food that spoils. Jesus said, work instead for food that endures to eternal life that the Son of Man will give to you. Now, in contrast to our junk food menus, to what we feed ourselves, and to some things that are actually dangerous, Jesus has prepared a gourmet feast of food that endures to eternal life. And He has offered that feast to us. And it comes at no cost. It will satisfy our deepest hunger and our, and our deepest thirst forever. All that's required is to let Jesus come into the dining room of our hearts and to let him take over the menu. We have to surrender what we feed on. And we need to start feeding on what God would have us grow with. But you need to let Jesus do the cooking. It means some adjustments in, in, the, in the diet. If we give Jesus the dining room of our hearts, it's probably going to change some things dramatically in what we eat. He is going to cut way back on the empty accomplishments and achievements and possessions. He is going to cut out the addictions and the lustful desires completely. And He is going to replace them with the sort of food that Paul describes in his letter to the Philippians, a passage we looked at last week when we talked about how to fill our minds. Food that is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Do you remember Paul saying that last week? Think on these things. Well, here Jesus would also be saying, Consume these things. Make them a part of your life. Sometimes that's hard to do. 
But I can promise you this. Once we start to get a taste of the good food of God, it will just make us hunger for more and more of what's right. And it will get easier and easier to abide on the new diet. Now, here are three things we can do to begin to adjust our diet. Three practical things. First of all, take a few minutes to review your daily menu. Take time to review your daily menu. You might want to do this this afternoon. At least do it here at the first part of the week. Do a menu audit, if you will. Ask yourself, am I choosing to feed my soul and to feed my appetites or my desires? Which is it? Do I feed my soul or do I feed my personal appetites and desires? What books am I reading? What websites am I visiting? What music am I listening to? What movies am I watching? How much time do I spend in front of a television set? And how much time do I spend with God's Word open in front of me? How much time do I spend serving others and loving others? And how much time do I spend just simply entertaining myself? Take a spiritual audit of the food we consume. What am I feeding my soul? Second, don't just settle for less. Do something about it. Don't take the audit and realize, well, I'm really not doing very well. That score's pretty low. Oh, well, I've managed this far. I've, I've done fine. I'm going to keep on going the way I'm going. Don't just settle for less. Do something to change. If what you determine is that you're lacking time with the community, take a step toward joining a community organization, a community group, a service organization. Do something with the church when we go out and, and, and minister to others. Or if it's a knowledge of God or God's word that's missing from your diet, then join a study group. Commit yourself to regular worship. Find someone within the church who can mentor you and help you learn and be a student of God. If you're missing that service for others, there's opportunities all over the place for waiting for our response. But once we determine what is missing, we need to decide that we're tired of settling for less and we're going to do something about it. Take the audit. Don't settle for less. Do something about it. And finally, make God's word the last word of your day. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to be right there with you. I'm as guilty as anyone else. I fall asleep in front of a television set. Does anyone else ever do that? Yeah. Or I fall asleep, uh, you know, looking at a, or just shutting a computer screen, and that's the last thing I read. Take a Bible, set it beside your bed, and make an effort this week. Even if it's just reading for 30 seconds, make an effort this week to be sure that the last words your eyeballs see are God's Word before you close your eyes. Now, you may not be able to keep your eyes open. You may fall asleep before you're done reading. You may want to kick yourself and say, well, I can't do that. I'm so tired at the end of the day. Go to the book of Psalms. Read some of the short Psalms. Go to the book of Proverbs. Read a section of that sage and wise device, uh, advice. Go to, go to the Gospels. Start reading again the story of Jesus' life. But read something from God's Word and make God's Word the last word of your day. Just pick up that Bible and read. The point is that the last food that enters our heart each day is what we're going to be sleeping on. And if it's the food that God has prepared, we're going to be sleeping soundly. We need to not let the world influence our lives. We need to let God influence our lives. Try this. Try this exercise. If you don't have a Bible, come talk to me. There's, there's at least a dozen Bibles that have been in our lost and found department here at the church for a long time, and they're all stacked on a shelf in, in, in the library. No one's claimed them. If you don't have a Bible that you can set by your bed, go in the library today, and there's a, there's a shelf there that says, lost a Bible? Maybe it's here. Grab one of them. No one else is grabbing them. Don't take something off the regular bookshelves, please. But off that little rack that's, that asks if you've lost a Bible. We've got Bibles here. We can buy you a new one. We don't want any excuse for someone saying, oh, well, I can't do that. I don't have a Bible. Oh, please, please, we want to share the Word of God with you. The good news is that we have been invited to a gourmet feast, and we do not 
have to settle for less. We choose to, but we should not. We should not settle for less. I want you to hear the invitation to the feast one more time. And if you're hungry, or if you're thirsty, or if your soul is not satisfied, then listen. Listen to what I'm about to read. Listen because these words are spoken directly to you. If you know that you've been feeding on junk food, and it's time, it's time to feed on God, then don't read the words, even though they're going to be on the screen. Close your eyes and listen. Listen to what God is saying about the menu He offers. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy. But listen, just listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear to me and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. We're filling our bellies and yet we're dying of malnutrition. I'm afraid that's the way it is for many people who try to be spiritual. They fill their bellies with all sorts of things, but they're starving. Starving because they haven't filled themselves with the goodness of God. If you are inviting Jesus to live in your heart, you have to make room for him in the dining room. And you have to surrender to him what's not good and let him prepare that meal that will satisfy you throughout the rest of this life and satisfy you throughout eternity. Will you? Will you make a commitment to get rid of the junk, to quit eating so fast, to stop taking what's dangerous into your life? whether it's relationships or attitudes, and start living for the one who feeds you forever. Jesus offers it. It's his invitation. Come and dine with him. If you need Jesus, we have the privilege of inviting you to come to him today and to open up your heart and to let him live in you and start surrendering those things that don't belong to the one who can fix them all. It's Jesus. Would you do that? If you're outside of Christ, if you need his presence and his spirit in your heart and in your life, we invite you to come forward and state that today, and we'll tell you what you need to do according to the scriptures to come to Christ. Let's stand together and let's sing.